Hi, I'm Warwick from Hotter and Steenbeck, and today we're going to make a video that's following up on our Need to Know Basic series. In that series, we talked about the common questions that we've encountered over the years to do with airbrushing. And of course, in the comments, uh, you guys gave us a bunch more. So in this video, we're going to address them. No doubt there's going to be more questions raised, which we'd love to address as well. So go ahead and put those in the comments on this, and we'll follow up on this one as well. So let's go straight into the first question. Steve, if you'd like to throw that one at me. OK, so the first question is, what's the best way to correct a mistake? For example, if I make the area too wet and I keep trying to airbrush over it, and mm. keep pushing it wetter and wetter, what is the best thing to do? OK, so um, generally speaking, if there's one piece of global advice that I can give you about airbrushing, is always remember that patience is really useful when you're airbrushing. So, don't try to speed up getting out of a mistake. If you do make a mistake, the first thing is, is just to take a breath, step away for a second. Um, you don't want to try to correct anything that's too wet by doing anything more on top of it. Generally speaking with the airbrush, you want to lay down coats that are just on the dry side. You don't ever really want to build color in a way that it looks glossy and wet. As soon as you do that, you're literally within a millimeter of having a problem. So try to put the paint down so it looks satin. If you do go into making it look too wet, take your airbrush a little bit away from the work. So maybe something like 20 centimeters, 15, 20 centimeters away. Just push the trigger down to blow air over the work. The cool thing about an airbrush setup is, is you've usually got a moisture filter in your system, which is going to be drying that air off. So you'll be putting some air over there that's going to dry that paint really fast. Once the paint has gone off dull and matte again, and you're very confident that it is dry, that's when you can come in and correct. And it depends what you've done. If you put too much light, then obviously you're going to come in with some dark. If you put too much dark, you're going to come in with some light. But the key thing is, if you put too much paint on, deal with it being wet first and foremost before you even think about doing anything else. Jordan, let's have another. So, as someone who's invested into GW products and Citadel paints, can I use them on with, well, with an airbrush? Yeah, definitely. I mean, pretty much any kind of acrylic paint is going to work really, really well. Um, I think that uh, when you go into you know paints that have been made specifically for the airbrush, without getting into too much detail, there are certain characteristics of an airbrush paint that are different from a brush paint that do make the paint atomize a little bit better, but we are talking about increments. So don't think for a second that if you've got um, a whole uh, sort of bevy of brush paints, whatever brand they are, that that's an impediment to getting started in airbrushing. Definitely not. Go to that brand, buy their airbrush thinner if they have one, which they usually do. Use that to thin their brush paints. That's definitely more than good enough for you to get going and get started on your airbrushing journey. It's kind of cool to start that way if that's what you've got anyway. When you do then buy some airbrush paint, you'll then be able to gauge the differences and kind of decide for yourself whether you think you need to invest in a whole new airbrush range or whether you're good to go as you are. A lot of people are, by the way. A lot of people do great work using brush paint that's just been thinned. The rule is, is try to get it thin enough that if you dip a, an old airbrush needle into the paint and then pull it out, you want that paint to drip off the end of the needle, not by falling off it, that's a bit too thin. You want it to drip off steadily, but you don't want to see any elasticity on the drip. You don't want it to be like, blop, right? Then it's too thick. You just want it to be a nice steady drip without any elasticity on the drip. Whatever the acrylic paint is, if you prepare it that way, that's going to work just fine. You, you can also use water as a thinner, by the way. Um, it's just you have to be a little bit more careful when you use water as your thinner that you don't let the paint get too wet. It happens a little easier when you're using water as a thinner, but you can you can absolutely use water as, as a thinner as well. Uh, next question from Stephen again. Okay, so the next question is, should I start with a darker color and work up to a lighter color? Or should I start light and then work down the spectrum of colors? So mm. bring the shadows in. Yeah, I love this question. So for that, I'm going to refer you to another video that I've made specifically on the topic. But if I can summarize it in a really quick way, you have to understand that one of the most effective ways that the airbrush works is by using color transparently to tint from light down through to progressively darker. The only exception to that is when you're working on a piece that's got a lot of uh, surface detail molded into it, for example, a miniature, 
you probably want to hit that first of all with your darkest shadow value to get it into all the recesses on that item. And what you can then do is, let's say your light source is here, you're going to come in there with your lightest value of highlight and allow that paint to settle on the piece in the same way that light would do if the light was there. What that'll do is it'll preserve all of your shadow values which have been already painted on the, on the recesses of, of the molding of the model. And you then work in the same way as you would with any other kind of airbrushing. Once you've established those highlight values, you tint your colors into that. So you work in light through to dark. And then you tend to finish by just reinforcing the very, very points of those highlights. When you're working on a flat surface with no surface relief, no surface detail, such as a canvas, let's say, or a motorcycle or whatever, um, you would tend to start, you forgo that priming step because there's no recesses to pick up. And you just start with light, work down through dark, and then come back and reinforce those final highlights. Let's take another question from Jordan. So if I'm going to be um, painting a minute or airbrushing a miniature um, or object, do I still need to prime said miniature or object? Look, I mean, this is the easiest way to answer this question. Um, the main purpose of priming is to make sure that everything that you put on after the primer is going to stay there. Okay, so just ask yourself this question. If you're going to spend three hours painting this thing, do you ever want that paint to come off? No. So you really want to prime it nicely so that the basis of your paint scheme that you apply to that has got some really good robustness and longevity that you can enjoy for many years to come. So I would say always consider putting down a quality primer to really give a good base to all the work you're about to do. Yeah. So now we're going to go to another question um, asked on behalf of someone by Seb. So how do I look after a compressor? Okay, so the main thing to be concerned with with uh, compressors is to understand that whether or not it has a tank, okay, whether or not it has a tank, um, what the job of it is is to compress air. When you compress air, there is a risk that the moisture that's in the air will drop out. Okay, and so it, if it's a tank compressor, you'll typically find that you get a bit of moisture filling in the tank. I know a lot of compressors nowadays come with moisture filters on, on the inline, but there's always a capacity before that on your compressor. Whether that's a tank or not, there's always a capacity there. If it's got a tank, you'll always find, if it's a quality compressor, you should always find somewhere under that tank or low on that tank, there's a valve which enables you to drain that tank. That's specifically there to discharge any moisture that's built up in that tank. So the best way to use that is you charge the compressor up till the tank is full, open that valve. Don't point it at anything you know, that you don't want to get dirty water on because that's what's going to come out of there. If you've got a compressor that doesn't have a tank and you want to make sure that you're not getting any moisture dropping out on your system that could compromise the longevity of your compressor, just make sure that at the end of the session you remove the hose uh, from your compressor so that air can circulate back into the system uh, while you're not using it. And that's a really good way of making sure that you're looking after your compressor well. There are other compressors which uh, run with oil in the system. They're becoming less and less common because they're more expensive. They are useful for being silent. The, the oil-free compressors tend not to be quite as quiet. And of course on those ones, periodically you'll need to change the oil on them and keep it topped up but you know that's relatively infrequent most manufacturers will tell you every year but in reality if you do it every three to five as long as you make sure it's kept topped up um, in my experience that'll be more than enough we're going to go to another question from steve how do i control the spray pattern of my airbrush so um it depends what you mean by that um, if you're referring to the shape of it all airbrushes produce a conical spray pattern. Um, I think what the, the person asking that question is referring to is the, the, the size of what's landing on the object. Um, now, principally you control that with distance. So that cone of spray that comes out the front of your airbrush is like an ever expanding cone. So if your object that you're painting intersects that cone let's say only two centimeters away from the front of the airbrush, the spray pattern is probably only gonna be maybe seven or eight millimeters wide. If you move your object that you're painting further away, 
then of course that cone will have expanded more and you might be then getting something like a two or two and a half centimeter uh, wide spray pattern falling on it. Generally speaking, the further away you go, the further back you'll also pull your trigger. So the control over the size of your spray pattern tends to be more distance plus more trigger equals bigger spray pattern, less distance, less trigger equals a smaller spray pattern. Jordan, go ahead and give us another one. So how do I properly thin paint for my airbrush? So the, the, the quick and easy answer on this one is, I'm not gonna get into talking about which thinners you should use and so on and so forth, other than the, the, the rule that I would really encourage you to stick to, which is that use the thinner from the paint manufacturer who makes the paint that you're trying to thin. Okay, that's where your best results are gonna come from. The, the rule that I like to make is keep an old airbrush needle nearby. Whatever you're mixing your paint in, whether it's in the airbrush cup or in another container of some kind, dip the end of the needle into that and you're looking to have this drip that is not elastic. So the paint falls off the needle tip, not like water would, that's too thin, but it falls off in a way that the drips from the end of the needle that you've dipped in the paint don't stretch before they break. There's other aspects of that question of things like, is it okay to mix the paint in my airbrush? Um, absolutely, find the lazy way to work because it's more fun than the hard way to work. So that's the lazy way to work on that one. The only um, a bit of advice I'd give a around that is don't ever put the paint in before the thinner. Um, if you put the paint in before the thinner, when you add the thinner and you mix that up, it's quite hard to get to that bit of thick paint that's gone and really first into the finest passageways of the airbrush which are closest to the nozzle and you'll find that that won't spray through quite as nice in the first few strokes. If you put the thinner in first then after you've mixed the paint in the airbrush cup you just point the airbrush away from your work, give it a cu couple of pulls on the trigger just to get that thinner through and then the first paint that comes through is going to be nicely thinned and perfectly mixed. Um, if you want to be mega lazy with how you mix paint in the airbrush, which again, more lazy, more fun, um, is uh, you can do the bubble back technique, which um, is where you drop your thinner in, you drop your paint in, um, and then you pinch the front of the airbrush to close it off, push the trigger down, give it a little bit of a very slight pullback, and this will cause the air coming out the airways at the front of your airbrush to be forced to go back up the paintways and bubble up through your paint. And it does a fantastic job of mixing it really nice and uniformly. So that's a great technique um, for any lazy artists out there. We're gonna to go to another one from Steve. How is the best way I should hold the airbrush for the best control? Yeah, so I'm a little bit of a, um, I have some pretty strong opinions about this particular one. Um, you might, um, understand that because obviously one of the aspects of my job is to think quite carefully about the ergonomics of the airbrushes that we make and so I love to uh, try to encourage people to take advantage of that as much as possible. Now there's two hand postures that are typical, well no, um, there's two hand postures that are typical and then a third one that's kind of fascinating. Um, so the, 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 the fascinating one is using your thumb to paint with okay very uncommon you'd want to say that it's absolutely ridiculous that anybody would want to do it this way except for the fact that Geiger who is an absolutely incredible airbrush artist who did the artwork for the original Alien um, that's how he painted so now we can't say it's wrong because his artwork's amazing and that's how he paints um, but stepping out from him the two typical ways that I see people holding the airbrush is one like this where the forefinger is really kind of contracted, the hand is really closed, um, and a lot of people paint really great this way. The other way that I see people holding the airbrush is with the hand much more open, um, with the knuckles fairly flat, not closed up here in the palm, and with a forefinger that's fairly straight. I prefer this way, and I, I think there's a lot of advantages to it, and let me explain why. The first point is that one of the aspects of the airbrush that's a little bit unique in terms of painting is that you don't touch the surface that you're trying to paint. Um, and so you need a good way of aiming at it. And so I can't think of a better way of aiming than to point at what you're trying to paint. You know, there's never been a human who walked the planet who 
couldn't actually point at the thing that they meant to point at. Nobody misses when they point. It's very intuitive. So having your finger over the front of the airbrush, over the trigger of the airbrush, in this way, I think gives you instinctively a great way of laying paint down where you actually want it to go. The other thing about it that's really significant is it enables you to kind of rest the airbrush on uh, your, your third finger here, your thumb, and the crook of your hand in a way that doesn't need you to grip it. So as soon as you start to grip it, after you know 30 minutes, 40 minutes, you can start getting this cramping across your hand, and that limits how long you can paint for, and nobody wants a limit on that. So this way of holding it keeps your hand nice and open, really relaxed posture. There's not a lot of muscular tension in holding the airbrush this way. And the final uh, thing that I like about this posture is when you pull the trigger back, you want to let this knuckle collapse down and this knuckle bend, rather than the other way where they both bent this way. The reason why that's important is letting this knuckle collapse down when you pull in the trigger keeps your point of contact on this fatty pad here rather than on the tip. Now, if you look at your fingers, this point on your finger here has a lot less nerve endings and the skin is a lot tougher on it than this point here. It's a lot more sensitivity there. Okay, it's a lot more tactile. And of course, it's just better for control. It's much, much better for control. So in summary, try to hold it like this with your finger pointing at the work, with the under pad on your finger on the top of the trigger, and with your, your palm fairly open, because I think you can paint for longer, more accurately, with a better feel of the trigger. So hopefully that covered a bunch of them. Uh, but if you've got any more, please put them in the comments. Um, it's great when you do that because then we're actually answering what we know you want to know. So please go ahead and put your questions in the comments and we'll come back to this and deal with those in another video. Thanks so much. And don't forget to like and subscribe because it really helps us to know that what we're doing is the stuff that you guys value. Thanks a lot.